in your study of biochemistry, you're going to come across many different types of biological reactions that take place inside our body and inside our cells. Now, for every one of these biological reactions, in order to be able to determine what the pathway of the reaction is and what the final structure of the final biomolecule is in that particular process, we have to consider the many different types of factors that can influence the reaction pathway and the structure of that final product molecule. Now, so far we discussed three of these important factors. We discussed how intermolecular bonds can influence the final structure of that biological molecule. We discussed hydrogen bonds. We examined London dispersion forces, also sometimes known as van der Waals forces. And we also discussed the hydrophobic interactions and the hydrophobic effect. Now, we also discussed how the solvent in which the, uh, the reaction is in can influence the pathway of that reaction and the final structure of that molecule. For example, we said that the majority of the reactions that take place in nature and specifically in our body take place in water. So water is the universal natural solvent and the properties of water can influence the reaction pathway as we'll see in just a moment. We also spoke about thermodynamics and how in any reaction we always have to remember that that reaction has to obey the laws of thermodynamics. So it has to obey the first law of thermodynamics that basically states that energy is never created, energy is never destroyed, energy can only be transformed from one form to another. So the total amount of energy in our universe is always constant. We also have to remember the second law of thermodynamics, which basically describes the fact that in any real biological process, the change in entropy of the universe is always positive. It always increases. So we also have to consider the temperature and the conditions under which a reaction is taking place. Because under certain conditions, a reaction might be spontaneous, but under other conditions, the reaction might not be spontaneous. And so we have to consider the Gibbs free energy of our reaction. Now, another factor that we haven't yet focused on is the pH of a solution. So in the next several lectures, we're going to discuss how the pH of a solution can also influence the pathway of the reaction and the final structure of that biological molecule. So to demonstrate how these factors can influence a particular biological reaction, let's take a look at a common reaction, the formation of a double helix of DNA. So inside every nucleus of every cell in our body, we have DNA. Now, the DNA doesn't exist as a single strand, it exists as a double helix. Now, from basic biology, we know that a double helix consists of these two single strands of DNA that run in an anti-parallel direction opposite with respect to one another. Now, on the outside of the DNA, we have the phosphate groups and we have the carbon backbone as well as the deoxyribose sugars. And on the inside of that DNA double helix, we have the bases that pair with each other. So the question is, how do intermolecular bonds, how does the reaction solvent, and how does thermodynamics basically influence this reaction, the formation of the double helix of DNA? So let's begin with the intermolecular interaction. So the question is, how exactly do these intermolecular interactions drive the formation of the double helix? So let's take a look at the following diagram that basically describes a portion of our double helix. So this is the deoxyribose sugar and for simplification purposes, I've omitted the hydroxyl group. So no hydroxyl groups are found on these sugar molecules. So we have the sugar that is attached to our phosphate and the sugar and phosphate is basically on the outside of that DNA. So this is the outside portion of the DNA that interacts with the solvent, in this case water. Why water? Well, because in the nucleus we have water that predominates and that's why it acts as a solvent. Now on the inside of the DNA we have these bases.
The question is, why exactly does this interaction actually take place? Why is it favorable from the intermolecular perspective, from the intermolecular interaction perspective? Well, number one is, on the inside of the DNA molecule, we have these bases that are able to form hydrogen bonds. So we have one base that interacts with a complementary base on the other single strand molecule and that forms our hydrogen bond. So in this case, this is hydrogen bonding and this is also hydrogen bonding. So we can say hydrogen bonding and this is also hydrogen bonding or simply H bonding, okay? So a base on one DNA strand interacts with hydrogen uh, via hydrogen bonds with a complementary base on the other DNA molecule. And so when these single strand molecules approach one another, these hydrogen bonds that are formed, that is a stabilizing effect. Now, what about the second type of interaction, the London dispersion forces? So, notice that these base pairs are essentially parallel with respect to one another, so they lie along the same exact plane. So, they are essentially stacked on top of one another. Now, remember, when they are stacked on, on, on top of one another, there are instantaneous dipole moments that exist within our bases. And those instantaneous dipole moments will interact with one another via the London dispersion forces. So, not only do we have hydrogen bonding between the complementary adjacent bases, but we have the van der Waals forces, these London dispersion forces between our bases stacked on top of one another. So these are H bonds, but these brown bonds are essentially our London forces, the London dispersion forces. So we have these two important types of intermolecular bonds that play a role in forming our DNA double helix. Now, not only that, but because the bases are essentially nonpolar, notice what happens. So the entire DNA molecule is swimming around in the solvent in water inside the nucleus of the cell. And water is a polar molecule. So what that means is these bases, which are predominantly nonpolar, will not want to interact with that polar water solvent. And what this double helix structure ensures is that all these nonpolar bases are found inside the structure of the double helix and away from the polar water molecules. And so that is known as the hydrophobic effect. And these bases will interact via the hydrophobic interactions and that will be a stabilizing effect. So we see that we have hydrogen bonds, we have London dispersion forces, and we have the hydrophobic effect that basically ensures that the double helix is a favorable structure. Now, the only type of non-favorable interaction is basically the interaction between the phosphate groups. So notice that this phosphate group has a negative charge. This phosphate group also has a negative charge. And when we have two like charges in close proximity, they will create a repulsive force. And so the only type of electric force, the only type of intermolecular force that tends to separate these single strands are these positive, are, are these negative charges on these adjacent phosphate groups. So the negatively charged phosphate groups lead to electric repulsive forces. Now, normally under room temperature or in body temperature, at body temperature, these attractive forces overpower these repulsive forces. And so that's exactly why the double helix structure remains. Now, let's move on to the reaction solvent. How exactly do the properties of water, the solvent found in the nucleus, affect the structure of that DNA molecule? How does it lead to a double helix formation? So basically, outside this DNA molecule are a bunch of water molecules. So this is a water molecule, this is a water molecule, and so forth. Now, this is the oxygen, and these are the H groups. 
So we know that the H groups, because of the polarity of water, the H groups will be partially positive and our oxygen groups will be partially negative. So what that means is these polar water molecules will orient themselves in such a way as to interact with the phosphate groups that are pointing to the outside on the double helix DNA molecule and that will be a stabilizing interaction. So once again we see that not only do we have hydrogen bonds that exist between the bases but we also have these hydrogen bonds that exist between our water molecules and these phosphate groups and that will be a very stabilizing effect and so we see that the fact that water is the solvent the properties of water that acts as, a, as the solvent in the formation of the DNA molecule actually favorably leads favorably leads to the formation of that double helix DNA and finally let's discuss how the thermodynamics of this reaction is also favorable so let's suppose that this is our system and everything outside this box everything outside our system are the surroundings and let's suppose that the temperature at which our reaction takes place is either room temperature or we can also say it's at body temperature so it's either 25 degrees celsius or at body temperature 37 degrees celsius now, before the reaction takes place, we have these single strands of DNA. So we have three of these blue strands and three of these complementary red strands. Now, when this reaction takes place, what do we form? Well, we form three of these DNA molecules that are in their double helix form. Now, what can we say about the entropy of this system and this system after the reaction? Well, before the reaction took place, the entropy of the system was greater than the entropy of the system after the reaction. Why? Well, because in this case, we have much more order in our system as in this case. So actually, in this reaction, the entropy of this system decreases, it becomes negative. So the delta S of our system is negative. Now we know according to thermodynamics, this is only possible if this reaction releases enough energy to compensate for that decrease in entropy. And this is exactly what happens at room temperature or at body temperature inside our cells, this reaction is actually spontaneous because even though the entropy of the system decreases, there's so much heat, so much energy released into the surroundings that that increases the entropy of the surroundings by a greater amount than the decrease of the entropy of the system. And so what that means is the change in entropy of the universe is positive because if this is greater than this, then this is a positive value. For example, if let's say this is negative 10, but this is positive 20, that means this value will be a positive value. And whenever our delta S of the universe is a positive value, that means at that particular temperature, the delta G, the Gibbs free energy, will be a negative value. And so our reaction will be spontaneous, it will be favorable, and the product molecule will be formed. And in this case, that double helix DNA molecule will in fact form. So this is basically what we have to do, what we have to think about every time we examine a reaction in biochemistry. We have to think about how these different types of factors will influence that reaction pathway and the final structure of that final molecule. Now, what we haven't discussed yet is how the pH influences our reaction and we'll focus on that in the next several lectures.